All right, welcome to Electrical Engineering 2002. Give it a lick. Oh! <laughs> Stick out your tongue. Uh. Okay, one more time for camera. Welcome to Electrical Engineering 2002. You want it again? Oh. <laughs> you want to try again? You do it again. You do it again. Okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> you want to do it again? You want to do it again? No. Are you sure? No. Do it to this it. Okay. I don't know if y'all have the clearance for this, but we're gonna do it anyway. All right, let's begin. Uh, this chapter is not much fun. There's a big block of text coming up. I'm gonna warn you ahead of time because it's rather jarring. All right, this is the decomposition of the complete response, chapter 24. This is lecture 22, and I'm Art Turlup. What we have here today is we're going to look at what we call the complete response of a system. This concept is a little confusing at first. Um, basically, we've already kind of touched on this, and it's very similar to what we've done in the past, but it's, it's slightly different in our, how do we say, like, the, the way we're, we're dealing with our problems now, <laughs> Okay. So before in ODE land, we had uh, the sort of natural uh, thing that we looked at, which was the homogeneous solution and a forced thing that we looked at, or a forced response, which is what we looked at uh, as the particular solution. Um, so today what we're going to do for the complete response stuff is we're going to look at um, inputs and initial conditions. You know, like We've already done this before. Yeah, kind of. Okay, here it is. Oh, my God. Hopefully, I wrote neat enough. Uh, if not, you can copy it out of the book because that's where I got it from. <laughs> uh, okay. So, anyway, the ZIR, or zero input response, is the response to a specific set of initial conditions when the input is zero. Hence, the zero input, right? Zero input. Um, you'll never guess the zero state response might be when the initial conditions are set to zero. The state of the system is at zero at the beginning. Okay, so the for the first one, ZIR, it's related to that natural response of the system, um, but this does not have undefined terms like the homogeneous solution. So you remember when we had the homogeneous solution, we like couldn't figure it out. Um, well, we have a specific set of initial conditions, so we don't have to worry about it. And with the zero state response, it's pretty much the same thing as before, except if we have uh, the frequencies matching up. So that is, the frequencies of the forcing function should not match, reading down here, the roots of the characteristic equation for this to be true. If that happens, things break apart, and in fact, our zero state response is, is then different than what we had for the um, for the particular solution. Okay, so this is not meant to scare you or anything. This is just formal definitions that'll make more sense as we do some examples. And I think that's probably the best way to explain a lot of this stuff for this chapter. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and consider a circuit. No, no surprise there. That's usually how we start out and get into trouble. And we're asked to solve for uh, V out of T for all T greater than or equal to zero for an arbitrary I in. So you should expect that your solution then should have some, should be like some function of the uh, forcing function, i.e. it is the, what we're looking for here is the response, right? We're looking for the response to the system when the uh, 
when the input is arbitrary and unspecified, but our output is um, specified. So here we had a specified do, 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 specific set of initial conditions. So we had a specific set of initial conditions. So what we're going to do is actually kind of look at what happens here um, for the zero input response first. Okay, so this is a ZIR type of problem. Okay, let's build the circuit. Here's our circuit. We have a current source, I n of t. This goes up, back down, over, over to the right, then this way, then that way, and here's some capacitor. There we go. And this is disconnected, so. Um, I'm actually secretly putting in tiny switches and teaching you guys everything incorrectly. I don't know if you caught that yet, um, but actually none of the circuits that we've done so far have ever been connected. <laughs> Just to mess with you. Okay, um, I'm losing my mind here. This, don't ever record two lectures in one day. I've been, I did that yesterday. I'm trying to do it today. Man, it's not working out. All right, see what we get when we transform this into the um, Laplace domain. So recall that, uh, you know, last time you may have been scratching your head a little bit and saying, hey, Art, when we transform this into the Laplace domain last time, um, or the frequency domain, um, when I did the capacitor thing, I didn't have that funky little, uh, you know, directed current or anything like that going on in there, or, or voltage source. What's going on? I didn't have a current source or voltage source. Um, well, what's going on is you had zero for initial conditions. So in this case, we don't. So now we're going to account for those and we're going to be doing some work with it. All right. Uh, let's draw out the Laplace transform of this circuit. Um, for this one, because we have a uh, current source right here, um, the easiest one to do is going to be draw the one with the current source. So if you want to go back to, uh, to one of the previous lectures there, I think it was chapter or, uh, lecture 20. I'll go ahead and pull it up, make sure we got it. Yeah, here it is. So lecture 20, uh, we had, this is for the inductor. These are the two equivalent circuits we had for that there. And then um, looks like we had, I didn't really draw this out in a nice diagram, but you know, you can, let me pop it in here real quick for you. All right. So we had IC of S here, and then we split it up. This was ZC. VCS went here. Then these came back together. Like so. Okay. And then this spot right here was just... Uh, did I not draw it? Must draw... Oh, there it is. It's right here. <laughs> it's CV of zero. Uh, and then uh, that's it. It's just a constant there, Vc of zero. And it's pointing upwards here, okay? And our current is uh, presumably flowing down. All right, so yeah, there's there's the model we're going to use. It's, it's going to be this one because we have another uh, current source like that, and we're dealing with a capacitor here. So let's go ahead and use that in this model. So we have the following by Laplace transform. There's our I in with respect to S. We have this here. Oops. We're doing this in the Laplace or the uh, frequency domain. So we need to make sure that we keep this as an impedance. So this is just going to be one quarter. And then our uh, capacitor is going to turn into, you know what? Let me make this a little bit bigger so we can all see. Okay. I'll resize a little bit. There we go. Something like that. Great. Okay, so here's my capacitor. Close that off a little bit here. And, uh, oh boy, getting a little sloppy. We have another impedance right here. And we have a, another source, current source right here. Okay. And then these come together. And the way we're going to define these two, I believe that was in lecture 19. 
So recall that ZC here is defined for us as 1 over SC, back in lecture 19. So this is 1 over SC. So we should end up with 1 over 2S, right? We can just pop that in here if we want. And then our current, go back to lecture 20 here. Our current is just whatever that initial condition is times C. Easy enough. Our initial condition here is that uh, V out, which in this case is our capacitor, right, VC, is equal to 3 volts. So it's going to be 3 volts times C. Uh, and C is just 2, so that gives me 6. Not bad. So now what we can do is calculate our zero state response. Okay, so analysis of the circuit, I'm just reading straight out of the textbook here. Analysis of the circuit can best proceed using superposition. Therefore, the resultant output, V out S, will be the sum of the response to the input and the response to the initial conditions. From our above terminology, this means that our output is the sum of the zero state response and the zero input response. What this is saying, I'm going to try to interpret it the best way I can. What this is saying is that because we're effectively taking this part out and doing our calculation, and then taking this part out and then doing our calculation, what we're doing is we're effectively setting this equal to zero, right? Creating a zero input, I, the ZIR state. And then we're also generating the, uh, the zero state by taking this out because we're setting that input here equal to zero as well with the superposition principle. Okay, so superposition is basically buying us those two components together. So I know when we started out here, we said, hey, let's look at ZIR. But as a matter of fact, what we're really doing here is we're actually writing this out as the complete response by superposition. Okay? So let's do a little bit of math on this guy and see what we can get out. And then we'll be able to distinguish which pieces are which. Okay, because we started off with this um, uh, zero input, right? Um, here we go. So we have V, oops, this should be a capital, V out for the zero state response of S is equal to I n of S times Z R in parallel with Z C. Let's break this down a little bit. I'm actually going to transfer that circuit that we have and, uh, and redraw it for you guys here. Just a second. Okay. So here is our system. What is this representing? This is representing some kind of input to the system and we've turned off that initial condition. So by turning off the initial condition, this is part one of superposition, right? This is the same stuff you've done, presumably in 20,001 with superposition stuff. All we're doing here is we're just doing it in the frequency domain, okay? We're just turning off this guy. So this creates ZSR, okay? So we're going to get that V out ZSR. And the book says V out, really this is a VC, okay? This is a VC of S, and we're taking that part of VC of S that is coming from the zero state response. We've kind of already done this sort of methodology before with the superposition problem. I think we had either last time or the time before, but now we're putting a formal name to all of this. 
And so this is going to help us distinguish those two components that we uh, generate. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do the math. As, I, as I've said <laughs> probably three times and not, not delivered, but here we go. Finally, uh, I and S and we take these two in parallel. This is one quarter in parallel with one over two uh, S. And this is just going to give us the I N of S. Okay, so the nice thing about this uh, operator here is that um, when we have two one over some things in, in, in parallel with one another, we can just write them simply as um, their sum in the denominator, right? So this is just one over four plus two s. Or if you wanted to write this nicely in terms of how we do our partial fraction, um, we could write this even better as, and I'm going to write the entire equation so that we have it handy, ZSR of s is equal to i n whatever that may be times one over two and actually we should probably just keep this on the outside one over two times one over uh, s plus two okay and that's a nice way to write that out so that's our zero state response for our system and next what we're going to do so let me label this z s r this is a zsr example and next we're going to do Zir finally uh, get around to analyzing this portion. So what we have then is uh, z, oops, not z, v out zir is effectively that same circuit. Let me go ahead and paste it in here again. Okay, it's that same circuit except now we're turning this guy off, and we're looking at what happens. So effectively what we have then is just um, this the six is in um, I'm just gonna run through those other two. you know it's effectively the exact same thing as what we had before except now it's specified. So this is actually equal to uh, six times one over four in parallel with one over two s. Conveniently, uh, a lot of our stuff cancels here. Um, I'm sorry, we have the same uh, same kind of form as last time. We just have a, um, where we had a 1 over 2 before, um, we have 6 divided by 2, so it just leaves us with a, a 3 over s plus 2 here, okay? If you do do the, uh, the parallel operator here, that's what you end up with. Okay, so now what we want to do is calculate the entire thing, right? So um, probably should copy this part in. Uh, initial so the initial condition is not turn off the uh, the forcing function or forcing uh, we'll call it forcing function slash input it's really the real word it is turned off and then to keep in track this is part two of superposition And we have, this gives me ZIR, right? Okay, and I think that was it for uh, that. So we end up with just a nice little equation here. I'll rewrite it just to, not sir, zer. Oops, getting all crazy. There we go. Okay, that's it. So now we got to put these two pieces together. So we're going to take V out ZR, oops, ZSR plus V out ZIR, and that's going to give me my total V out in the S domain. So this is going to be equal to whatever it is. More importantly, we want to take the inverse Laplace transform of this, which gets me V out of S. So I want to know what my output is in, in time. And in order to do that, I just take the Laplace inverse of V out ZSR of S plus V out ZIR of S. And I can distribute that over those two.
like so. And what I end up with is the Laplace inverse of I n of s over 2 times s plus 2 plus the Laplace inverse of 3, oops, of 3 over s plus 2. And this is equal to just the Laplace inverse. I'm just going to carry this down for the time being to s plus 2 and then plus 3e e to the minus 2t ut. Of course, noting here that uh, this is just simply a frequency shift, and then we just see a frequency shift in the time domain. Okay, and that 3 just goes along for the ride. No big deal. All right, so our first term is the response to the input, and that's our zero state response. And the second term uh, represents uh, response to the initial conditions and represents... Um, the zero input response. I'm sorry, guys. This was a T here. Why didn't anyone tell me? Why didn't someone say something? You probably did. You were probably screaming at me. It's okay. So there we are. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to continue extending this. And we're going to uh, incorporate a specific input. So we're going to let i in of t is equal to this nice little step function, okay? So converting this to the Laplace domain, we have i in of s is equal to 2 over s. So now we have v out z s r of s must then be equal to the Laplace inverse of 2 over 2 s s plus 2. Well, then we just use partial fractions, right? So use partial fractions to break this up. We're going to divide and conquer. Or actually, we're going to add and conquer, right? Um, which is generally what you want to do when you conquer, right? You add stuff. But I'm... Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I'm losing it here, guys. It's too late at night to be recording this crap. If, if I had to actually teach you guys at 1030 at night, I'd be so wackadoo in person, it wouldn't even be funny. You think I'm crazy now? should see me teach live at like midnight. All right, let's do some work here. We got 1 over s, s plus 2. Uh, recall that we just keep all those constants out to the outside. Uh, these guys are going to politely cancel anyway, so it wouldn't matter. So we have, uh, you know, we, we do the partial fraction expansion. We end up with... 1 over or, uh, one half over s plus a negative 1 half over s plus 2. Um, you kind of already solved this one already, so I'm not going to go through the, the rigmarole again. Uh, so what we end up with at the end of the day is something that looks like this. So Laplace inverse of 1 half over s plus the Laplace inverse Okay, so there we go. We got uh, we got this stuff here. This is equal to um, one half. I'm going to write it this way uh, just so we kind of can see what's going on here. One half times u of t minus a frequency shifted e to the 2t. All right, so this is our final solution. Um, we combine the two pieces together again. Um, in, in some sense, we're coming back to forming Voltron, right? Voltron. Oh, that's not it. That's not Voltron. Let's try again. Voltron. Oh, nope. Actually, wait, was that sound wave? That's freaking sound wave right there. I had him all along. Okay, I knew I did. There we go. There's Voltron. Okay, we're going to put the pieces together like Voltron. Um, don't look at the timestamps to see how long it took me to go find Voltron. It will only make you cry. Okay, I'm just blind. I can't see what the hell is going on in this stupid iPad. All right, well, there's your there's your thing. Actually, I should put him back. Let's just leave him here. You can chill in here, right? Okay, let's put him up here. There. Hang out. All right. Now, I'm going to compile these two bits together and form my solution. So, I'm, I'm going to take this along for the ride. Uh... 3e e to the minus 2t 
ut. I'm just going to tack it right on here. So this is 1 half ut minus 1 half e to the minus 2t ut plus this bit. Fortunately, these are much the same. So pardon me while I do some eraser mechanics. And I end up with 3.5 or 5 over 2, however you want to write it, uh, e to the... Here, we can, we can do this. Zoop. Aha. There we are. And that's equal to my total V out of S. Notice here that this was just equal to um, that portion, right? This is V out S or Z S R of T. Why do I keep doing that? I've been so good about it until just today. All right, so of T, right? It's got to be of T because these are all functions of T. And that's it. That would be the end of the chapter, except it's not. We have to talk about something else, kids. All right. I have to talk to you guys about the dangers of phasers, okay? Type 2 phaser is assembled with a beam control assembly and a safety interlocking mechanism. You need to have the safety interlock mechanism activated in order for the safety to be applied to the test point subspace transceiver assembly recharging coil inside the pre-fire chamber mechanism. The phaser knows where it is because the phaser knows where it isn't at all times as it is in phase with its own self and phasers around it. Fa no, we're not doing that kind of safety phaser thing. We're, what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk about what we know about phasers, okay? And to do that, we need to talk about the complex plane just a little bit. I know you hate seeing this. This is JB or BJ or BI or IB. However you want to do it, don't care. Um, since I'm a mathematician, this is, you know, BI usually. But um, now I'm an electrical engineer, so I guess it's JB now. Um, let's do this thing. This is rectangular coordinate system. Uh, typically, we'll write things as A plus BI in this setup. Uh, you should be familiar with complex conjugates, A minus bi. Um, this notation generally for what we're going to, going to do is going to be a pain in the ass. So we're not going to do it. Um, we're generally going to try to keep things in uh, polar notation. All right. So if we multiply these two things together, we get a squared plus b squared, right? And that gives us a nice little magnitude, if you will, of some type. Um, but it's not really giving us a good story here. So rather than do that, we can leave the A and Bs here if we want to. But um, really the way we want to represent any kind of vector, and it really is a vector because it has these two components to it, but any kind of complex number that we're concerned with is we want to represent it as a magnitude. We'll call it M. And an angle. Uh, what, do we what do you guys typically use? I would ask you, but you're not here. So I guess I'll go with theta. Uh, I like theta. I don't know if you guys use theta or phi for, uh, for this typically as a, as a placeholder. Well, whatever you learned it as, it's theta now, so deal with it. Um, you can represent anything in the complex plane. We talked about this a little bit as e to the uh, j theta, right? m times e to the j theta. e to the j theta represents the sine and cosine components of this vector, all right? So if I broke this apart, uh, this would give me the cosine theta times m, and this would give me m times the sine of theta, uh, and actually tack a j on there because we're on the jb axis. All right, nice enough, easy enough. Um, the thing that's probably most important about this, however, is actually um, not the rectangular components of this, but rather how I operate with these things together. So instead of writing e to uh, m times e to the j theta every time, we're just going to write this as m with an angle theta. Now, typically when we're dealing with um, sines and cosines and stuff, we kind of have some uh, frequencies to keep around and along for the ride that we need to keep track of. We usually denote these as omega and note that omega is a radial frequency. And F is equal to, I'm sorry, uh, oh no, I lost all my stuff. Uh, 2 pi F, 
Okay, do that then. 2 pi f is equal to omega, um, where f is actually our uh, frequency in hertz. And unfortunately, uh, mathematicians hate you, and so everything uh, for all of our standard operations is done in um, frequ uh, radial frequency. Eh, pi is a nice number. Just, just trust me on it, okay? But... <laughs> But realistically, um, you're going to have to be flexible with going back and forth between omega and f, okay? Just know that one is radial and one is hertz. Okay, so when we write this out, um, one of the operations that we run into all the time is multiplication, right? So we have, say, some m e to the j theta 1, uh, we'll call this m1, and then we multiply it to uh, m2 e to the j theta 2, right? If you want to think about it that way. Um, what happens here is we multiply these two components and we add the other two components, right? This is, should, should all be a review for you guys. I hope it is. Um, so if I'm multiplying two of these complex vectors together in polar notation, this is how I do it. Um, the notation for this would look something like the following. I know this should this should be trivial to you guys, okay? If I multiply these together, this is just m1, m2, angle of theta1 plus theta2, and then mod whatever. Oh, are you guys familiar with this? I don't know. Raise your hand. No? Okay, someone's not. That's okay. So modulus uh, just means, basically, if you think about it, if all your numbers were in a clock, right, um, it goes up to 12, and then it resets. It starts back over at zero. 12 is equivalent to zero. So, you, you know, oh, zero, zero, 30, right, is, is 1230 if you're in the military or something or whatever. So modulus just means that you're um, repeating with respect to something. In this case, it would be repeating with respect to 360 if you're doing uh, angles or if, you, you know, you could do it with respect to 2 pi. Okay, the reason I bring this up is because typically we're going to see this, actually. More often than not. And you can see that happening already because when we're in the uh, frequency domain, you've seen those pesky polynomials over some other pesky polynomials. Well, guess what? This is exactly what's going to happen. We're going to have a bunch of crap up in the numerator, a bunch of crap down in the denominator, and we're going to have to figure out how to compile them together. And we're going to use some of this phasor notation to do it sometimes. Not always, but, but sometimes. And uh, we got to be careful how we, how we treat it. Okay, so uh, when you do that, then uh, it's just going to be m1 over m2. And then you subtract these two instead of add them together, right? Because then you're just subtracting uh, when you have one thing over another. And the exponents just subtract from each other. Yeah, makes sense. Good. That was like your crash course into rectangular and polar coordinates for the uh, phasor notation. Easy, right? Okay, so let's get back to our example here, and what we're going to do is we're going to assume an input function. And the whole reason why we talked about phasors here in the first place. We'll get there. Let's say that our input function was 5 cosine of 2t times ut. Um, if zn is equal to this thing, what is the Laplace transform of this? We have in of s is equal to uh, 5 times the cosine. The cosine carries with it the s. All right, so we have the s up here. And then that t actually becomes part of this thing down here. So this is s squared plus, I'm sorry, not the t, the 2, uh, s squared plus 2. And the ut is just to keep us honest with where our start and end points are. Our, our end point is at infinity, so there you go. Um... And then our zn of s is equal to what? Um, we calculated it previously. It's just the um, funny little uh, parallel combination of zr and zc. And we're going to assume system is at rest. Okay. So this, is, this part here is equal to 1 over... Uh, 2s plus 2. And it probably would be helpful if I actually brought the circuit back so you know what the heck I'm talking about. So we have i n of s is specified here. We now have, oops, actually, 
it's not that guy, it's this guy. So that's specified, and then this portion, let me do it in red, is actually turned off. No way. All right, and then we just did the parallel combination of those two guys. Okay, so not a big deal here. All we're going to do is just um, multiply these two pieces together. Why are we doing that? Because that's what our final V out of S is going to be, right? We talk, we've talked over and over about this. So it's just I N of S times Z N of S. V equals I R. And in this case, we're in the Laplace domain or the, the frequency domain. So this is going to be our impedance. So we end up with uh, 5 S over S squared plus 4 times 1 over 2 S plus 2. And you can already see where this is going. We're going to partial fraction land. And we do the expansion for this. And we end up with uh, 5 over 2 on the outside. The S just sits up top. And use your favorite method for this. Oops, not 4 squared. It's going to be 2 squared. And we can set this up as A over S plus 2 plus B S plus C over S squared plus 2 squared. We get A is equal to minus 5 eighths. If we do the partial fraction um, by setting S equal to uh, 0, we get C. And C gives us 5 over 4. And then finally B, uh, and let me write it this way, S equals 2 uh, gives us B, which is equal to uh, 5 eighths as well. But it's positive this time. So then our final V out is going to give us, capital V out of S is going to give us minus 5 eighths over 1 over S plus 2 plus 5 eighths over s over s squared plus 2s. Nope. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, s over 2 squared. There we are. Uh, plus 5 eighths times 2 over s squared plus 2 squared. And notice here that we shuffled some things around to make things work out nicely. That C that was right here, we just split up that uh, 4 as 2 over 8. Yeah, nothing too crazy there. Everyone's still tracking. So the C that was right here, I turned that into, turned this guy into 5 times 2. Kept the 8 out here, okay? There we are. Actually created a nice little constant factor across there, right? Okay, so now we have two versions of sinusoids, both sine and cosine, um, whereas our input was only a single cosine. What the heck is going on here? I had I had a singular, you know, nice little wibbly wobbly wave going in there. It's all constant, constant cosine. What the heck is going on? Well, actually, if I use a handy-dandy equation, I can get a little bit of clarity here. Because I have the same thing going on... Oh, I need to convert this first. Sorry, before I get all crazy. Oop. We'll get there in a second. V out. I can just see the, the frequency space. That's, <laughs> that's what's going on. I'm not reading ahead in the textbook, I promise. Um... E to the minus 2t ut plus 5 eighths cosine 2t ut plus 5 over 8 sine 2t ut. Okay, uh, this is really trivial to, to convert, guys. By now, you should actually be able to see this and realize what it, its output is. Uh, you should immediately re uh, be able to represent or recognize it uh, right away. Okay, so this is just alpha plus arctan minus b over a. Okay, the mathematician in me is coming out. I'm sorry, but you have to deal with this, all right? 
this is equal to this. Arctan is equal to the function which when applied to a tangent returns we can do it this way okay so basically it's the inverse operation of tangent all right however you want to write it Okay, so please don't use this. I know engineers are going to use it all over the place. Tell them to stop it. Spread the word. Save the one over tangents, okay? Please, for you and for your family, please do that. Okay, so using this equation, what we end up with is the following. You'll notice here that this is some angle plus a shift, and then a nice little magnitude uh, that's composited from the magnitude of A and B. Because remember, these just, uh, whoops, these just live between uh, 0 and 1, or negative 1 and 1, wherever they live. Okay, so we end up with uh, V out then of T, and this is, he's written uh, steady state component. So what do we mean by steady state component? Well, the steady state component is just going to be the thing that doesn't go away, right? So as I go out to infinity, what happens to this bit? It disappears. It goes bye-bye. So if as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and these just keep on oscillating, right? So these are steady state plus a zero steady state, okay? Does that make sense? So when I write out steady state here, what I'm looking at is kind of that limit as t goes on. So I don't really care about what happens immediately after uh, the system starts up at t equals zero. I care more, much more, about where it's going to go in the long run. All right? That's not always true. Sometimes I care about the most immediate thing. But uh, in this case, I care more about the steady state for the purposes of analysis here. So this is 5 over 4 square root of 2 uh, cosine 2t. Two you can just do the calculations here. Uh, pi over 4, we do the uh, arctangent of the ratio. And uh, ut so that we know where this guy starts, right? It has to start at 0 and continue on ever afterward happily. Aha! Check this out. So this is actually a cosine function that's been phase shifted. Now, you may recall the general form for a cosine function. We have the amplitude, a. Let's do some anatomy here. Uh, Omega t minus theta plus theta. We'll do plus theta. So this is a frequency and radians. This is my variable time. Right? It's very able to be anything. We just keep running through time. This is a phase shift. And you should note that the phase shift, you know, depending on how you, you cage everything, um, phase shift is going to push you through... Uh, into maybe looking more like a sine than a cosine, right? It's going to push that wave, whatever it may look like, ever, you know, this much theta, all right? And the reason that this happens in time, as you might be able to figure out in a, in a way, is that this is affixed to this guy here. It's actually affixed to the omega t, really, uh, in a way. So that's what's really going on here, is um, we have a phase shift term occurring here. So seeing the form of things is much more important than actually being able to read the numbers off, right? Being able to see that these different pieces have different meanings. You can even color code it if you want. I'm going to pause myself here and then I'm going to color code these for you. So here we go. Okay, I think that should do it. Um, so yeah, there's everything color coded for you. Nice and easy to read. Um, this should ever be present in your head. Whenever you see a sine or cosine function, you should always be thinking amplitude, frequency, phase shift every freaking time, every time. Okay. So what's going on here? So we have a, uh, our circuit has effectively been scaled by one over four square root of two. Why do we say one over four square root of two and not five over four 
square root of 2. Well, remember what we put in. Our input was actually 5 times this cosine function. So effectively, when we're looking at the output, we've taken what was this, and we've phase shifted it, and we've scaled it um, down by a factor of uh, 4 square root of 2. Okay? Oh, that's actually kind of cool. I actually did something to an input uh, oscillating signal, an undamped signal, i.e. an AC signal. Oh, here we go. We're getting into the cool stuff now. Oh, I, I'm getting shivers. Okay. All right. So now what we can do is we can think about what would have been our phaser analysis for this, right? So, so the book says, uh, you know, phaser analysis of the output voltage V out uh, progresses by simply multiplying our input current by the associated impedance. Makes sense. V equals IR, right? Our output current is represented as I in of T is equal to 5 at a phase shift of 0. Why is this the case? So let, let's go back to our notation real quick. Um, this is just representing a magnitude of 5 cosine 2t, we don't care about this frequency at the moment, minus plus 0, whatever that is, that's our, our guy here. Here, this is here, this is our magnitude. This is our phase. Why do we represent this as an angle again? Well, we represent this as an angle, theta, because of the equation e to the j. Oops. Oh, come on. Stupid pen e to the j theta, do 5 e to the j theta, um, where uh, theta represents the angle that we take in the complex plane, okay? Or jb, whatever, I don't care. And then this is m equal 5, all right? Here's our theta. So this is just a polar representation. All right. Hopefully this is like, really dull for you guys. If I had your faces in front of me, I'd be able to, you know, back off of this. But in case there's someone out there that just is confused as heck by this stuff, uh, I really want to make sure I cover it. Because um, if you haven't seen it before, it really is confusing. Um, but once you get used to it, it's actually very usable and very pliable. Okay, so our impedance now is equal to one-fourth in parallel with one over uh, j two pi f of two. Where the heck did that come from? But basically what's going on here is we're just accounting for um, an oscillator with the J and the uh, two pi F is, is capturing that, uh, that behavior for us. And we're multiplying by two because we had the, uh, the impedance of that capacitor, right? So there we are. Okay. So now let's go ahead and do the calculation. We have Z in of omega equal 2. We just take these two guys in parallel. Noting here that our, our frequency is, uh, is 2 in radian, in a radial frequency. Uh, and we need that J in there to, to keep us honest. What we have here is uh, these two in parallel. And uh, in order to solve for this, we got to think about things in the complex plane a little bit to convert from uh, rectangular into polar. So we end up with uh, 4 plus 4j. And for this, what we're really looking at is a magnitude of, uh, we want to get this as a, as a unit vector, right? So this is going to be equal to uh, 1 over, mm, what's the easiest way to do this? Oh, geez. Okay. This is, this looks like this. So I'm just looking at the bottom portion here. Uh, this is four and then four J, right? So the angle here is pi over four, right? It's gonna be equal to 45 degrees because these two things are uh, equal to each other in length, excluding the J, this imaginary <laughs> length. Um, and then what we end up with then is a magnitude of uh, 4 squared plus 4 squared square root. So this is equal to 4 uh, square root of 2. Yeah. 
and then the magnitude of this is 4 square root of 2. So we'll write this in phasor notation because this is going to make life much easier. What's this guy? This is a magnitude of 1. If you look at it in the complex plane, it's magnitude of 1 with an angle of 0. Boom. All right. To simplify this, we have 1 over 4 square root of 2, and then we subtract these two from each other, so we end up with an angle of minus pi over 4. Okay? Bam, we're done. All right, our output voltage then, due to the input current, will be uh, V out of T is equal to V in uh, of T times Z in. And what we end up with that or for that is uh, 5, the phase of 0 is our input, uh, times 1 over 4 square root of 2 with a phase of that. We know what happens when we multiply, right? We just add the angles and straight up multiply the uh, coefficients. So we end up with 5 over 4 square root of 2 uh, with an angle of min minus pi over 4. And thus, we've just obtained the phasor analysis output. Uh, we just plug in that uh, handy-dandy frequency that I had before. And uh, what do you know? We've got our whole representation taken care of in that way. So effectively, what we're doing now is we're doing all this phasor stuff uh, that you probably are familiar with, but we're doing it in a much more refined way. Um, so I'm going to read from the, the book a little bit here. Uh, what we've obtained uh, is exactly the same steady state component uh, that came out of the Laplace transform by doing the phasor analysis. Uh, but now we completely lack the transient response. This illustrates why we will, in general, work with the Laplace transforms, okay? Which is kind of what we've been, been saying here. Um, that said, the ability to derive the frequency-specific behavior of a circuit using Laplace transforms will serve as a basis of frequency response because we need that Laplace domain to be able to work with frequencies. That's handy. Uh, which will be the core of the remainder of the semester. And that ain't no lie, let me tell you. All right, I'll see you folks next time.